It's time for Health Check with Heidi Gottman, a daily dose of health and wellness information. Call or text Heidi your questions at 373-1220. That's 373-1220. And now here's Heidi Gottman. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Health Check. I'm Heidi Godman. Hope you're doing well on this great day. A lot of rain headed our way out there. So if you're driving around now, you might want to try and wrap up your business outside, go to the store if you need to. We have a huge amount of rain that's about to soak the Sun Coast. But right now we are happy and dry and and ready to learn all about some very interesting health and wellness topics. In a little bit, we're going to be talking about a new class of antidepressant medications. And the amazing thing about these is that they seem to work in as little as 24 hours. Now, that is a big deal for people who need antidepressants because the typical medication, known as SSRIs, these things usually take, you know, up to six weeks before they kick in. And if someone is struggling with depression or another condition that might warrant an SSRI, and there are a few different conditions, then, you know, three to six weeks, that's a long time before your medication kicks in. So something that can work in just a day, that could make an enormous difference for a lot of people. And we are going to be talking to my great friend, Dr. Dean Sutherland, who's a prominent neurologist here on the Sun Coast. But we are going to start today by talking with another incredible physician, Dr. Manjula Jegasothi. She's a Harvard and Yale trained aesthetic dermatologist. And she happens to be in Miami. She's the founder of the Miami Skin Institute. And she's going to be telling us about some very, very interesting things, too. We're going to be talking about cosmetic ingredients that um, might lead to to skin allergies, things like that. We're going to talk about skin regimens. But we are going to start with her today by talking about this brand new way, a non-surgical way, to attempt to get rid of the fat in your neck. And if you're walking around and you feel like you have turkey neck, I have one girlfriend, she says, oh, I have turkey neck. I don't think that she does, but she does. Um, and, and so now there is something that can help men or women try to remove that, that sort of fat pocket that sometimes hangs beneath the chin. It's called Kybella. But there are some, you know, potential side effects. So let's find out if it's something that you might want to consider. It's brand new. So everybody say hello to Dr. Manjula Jegasothi. Welcome back. Thank you so much for inviting me back, Heidi. How are you? I am good. And I have been curious about this particular product because uh, the things that I've seen, it, it either seems really great or really scary. So so maybe we can, <laughs> let's start a little bit more uh, back to the condition. Tell us about the, the fat that sometimes accumulates beneath the chin. Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people that do have that fat underneath the chin or double chin or what we call medically the submental fat, the fat in the neck area, they aren't necessarily overweight. Um, it's really often a genetic thing that runs in families. My mom had a turkey neck, my dad had a turkey waddle, uh, everybody in my family has a double chin. And so it can often, A, appear in people who are of normal weight and B, in young people. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting old or that you're overweight. Okay, so where does it occur? And, and is it really fat cells? Or, I mean, how would they develop? Um, again, we are genetically programmed to put to deposit fat in different areas based on our families. But I mean, it As wouldn't. You know, but Manjula, it wouldn't. It, it wouldn't be de- deposited there until your later years. It's always the cells are always there. It's just through hormonal stimulation, and we think probably some gravitational component, they start to stretch and become bigger. Okay, so so maybe as you're getting older, that's what's happening. They're stretching, they're getting bigger, and nobody wants that. So the traditional way to treat this is surgery, right? Correct. There used to be no other treatment for it than surgery before one month ago. Before one month ago. And then suddenly this new product comes along, which actually everybody's been looking at for quite some time, but now it's finally available, and it's called Kybella. What is it? Uh, Kybella, uh, basically the, the, the ing- active ingredient is called sodium deoxycholic acid, and it's long, and all it really means is that it's a detergent. And whenever I explain it to patients, I like to say, I liken it to, let's say, dishwashing detergent. When you apply dishwashing detergent to the grease or fat that's on your plates, it dissolves it and makes it 
leave the plate. This is the same concept. You're in- injecting a detergent into the fat cells that then cause them to dissolve and break up, and then your body's immune system takes away the fat. So they're resorbed into the body, but, but do they come back? Um, no, that's the nice thing. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but like you said, we've been looking at it for a long time. There was a precursor drug to this product, to Kybella, that was available widely in the in Europe and um, South America, basically everywhere but the United States, called Lipodissolve, which was the same product. It was available for about 40 years now. Um, it was designed to dissolve fat embolus after surgery, and it never worked very well. So now they fine-tuned it. So basically, we know all about how it's excreted and all of those things. What it does is it breaks up the fat cells. Your immune system comes in and sort of, you know, takes away that fat debris, and then it's all excreted through the GI tract within a course of about three or four weeks. Okay. So before we talk about the good stuff, let, let's get the bad news first. What can some of the complications be? It's really actually very safe. The FDA took 10 years to approve it. They studied it for a really long time on a very large group of patients. Um, the, the worst thing that can happen is you can, you can not have all of your fat go away with one treatment. And, um, you know, many of the protocols do say that most people need between two and four treatments. So, you know, it can get expensive. Other than that, um, the side effects are just swelling. Um, a, my, a moderate amount of swelling. So for the first three days, you can't really go to a party or to anything important. You actually look worse than you did before. Um, there's really not very much bruising associated with the product, so that's not an issue. And then occasionally, I think they found in less than 1% of patients in the FDA trials that they got some kind of hardness or sort of like the, the fat almost became like a, like a um, bump mm. in certain areas, which then also dissolved within a month after treatment. Okay, and, and maybe the devil is in the details because I know that there can be some serious side effects, I'm sure you know too, uh, so nerve injury in the jaw that can cause an uneven smile and or even trouble swallowing. And that to me seemed like the scary part, but that seems to be if you're not mixing it properly, if you're diluting it with other compounds. Tell us about that part. Absolutely. Um, in fact, the product, not, unlike Botox and the other neuromodulators, the product comes mixed already and in a sealed vial that is supposed to be a single-use vial. So really, no practitioner should be mixing it with anything. They shouldn't be diluting it with anything. They shouldn't be adding anything. Um, and so therefore, the product as itself it should, be, should be used pristine. And then um, the issue with, you know, nerve involvement and stuff like that has to do with injection technique and not the product itself Um, because they also saw in the studies that a few patients got this kind of uneven um, sort of uptake where one nerve was a little bit affected, and we think that had to do more with the fact that the injector um, injected too close to that nerve, and so the, the inflammation that resulted damaged the nerve for a short period of time. But again, none of those results were long-term. Everybody um, regained the full function of any issues they had within four months after the injection. Okay, so it's sort of like Botox. If you get uh, some side effects from Botox, it's just temporary and it will go away. So, so that's encouraging. All right, let's talk about the good part now, because people who, who do have these, these turkey necks, if we want to call them that, they, they hate them and they want to get rid of them, but they don't necessarily want to go under the knife. So, so you were, yeah, you were saying earlier it might be up to six injections. Is that typical? No, it's not typical. Um, you know, I think the FDA studies in general, they always like to show a, a very dramatic result for the FDA to be to be happy to approve a drug. Um, and then the other thing is, they, obviously, they want the patients in the study to be as happy as possible. So always in the studies, they tend to use more medicine than we use in common practice. Um, I would say it depends on the person, but, you know, if we if we categorize mild, moderate, or severe turkey neck or, or double chin or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, a severe patient might need four sessions um, spaced about two months apart each. Um, a mild to moderate person might need only one or two sessions. All right, one or two sessions. And, and so how soon do you see results? 
Um, typically, as I said, you're swollen, so you're worse than your baseline for about three or four days. Then you go back to baseline um, for about probably two to three weeks. It kind of seems like nothing's happening, although I will say that it feels different. The, the actual skin and underlying fat kind of feel a little bit more soft and more malleable than they were before. I, and I'm telling you this from even from personal experience. As soon as I got the medicine, the first person's neck I did was myself. So, oh, really? Um, yes. And so I, I'm about three weeks out now, and I'm just now really starting to see the neck involuting. And it's really, it's going fast now, uh, and I'm on week three. Wow, very interesting. Oh, are you going to put up any before and after shots of yourself? Absolutely. You I always are. do on my Pinterest page, which is Miami Skin Institute at Pinterest. Miami Skin in- Institute at Pinterest. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, Miami Skin Institute at Pinterest. I'm writing it down. All of my before and after pictures for everything I do is mm, there. So very it's a interesting. Big gallery. Oh, everybody mm-hmm. should check it out. Okay, so so then let's talk about the price. How, how much should you be paying for this, whether you go so, to a practitioner in Florida or somewhere else? Because we do have people listening in other states and even other countries. Ah, that's wonderful. Um, absolutely. I think that um, what they are typically pricing now in big cities, which is where most of the doctors who are currently Kybella certified for at least this quarter, um, will be roughly $1,500 per treatment. Um, and remember, keep in mind, again, this is permanent. So you are comparing that to a typical mild liposuction of the neck, which, you know, usually is around five to $6,000. So this may seem like a lot for injections, but it's actually very little compared to what you would normally get with a surgical-type result. That is just amazing. And, and, of course, what everybody wants to know is, okay, when can you inject it into my stomach? But, but it's not approved for that, and they even think that it, it might never be approved for that. Tell us. Actually, um, I went to certify with Dr. Steve Fagian, who is a very well-known oculoplastic surgeon in Boca Raton, Florida, um, a couple, about three weeks ago. And he was saying that they, he, he was one of the investigators for the Kybella FDA trials for the neck, and he said that they already have almost all of the fat pocket body area studies uh, pending. So I think they will be studying it to the stomach and everywhere else. Because I thought they were saying, you know, no, no, it could be very, very dangerous in the stomach. I think, again, it all has to do with who uses it, how they use it, how much they use, and, you know, whether they're adding other things to it. You know, if you stay superficial in the stomach, superficial in the fat, instead of going deep into the muscle, um, they, you know, there shouldn't be any real bad or, you know, permanent adverse events. It might be swelling or a little bit of pain, ongoing pain. But um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but the company that oh, that brought to market Kybella was purchased by Allergan, the company that owns Botox Cosmetic. And they are very careful about their studies, And but they have a very great portfolio. As you know, Botox is indicated for something like, you know, 10,000 different indications yeah. in all organ system. So I think that they will be good about being able to get the FDA to really evaluate its safety, Kybella safety profile in lots of body areas. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't be worried about about that if you are going to someone like yourself, you know, someone who's trained, someone who has a lot of expertise, a lot of experience. But you know, that's how it you should be about Botox. But you can get Botox just darn near anywhere now, at a little kiosk, at the mall. You, you could get them in a lot of different places. And, and that, I think, is a little risky. Do you think we will say, see the same thing happen with Kybella? And then how do you find a great practitioner? I certainly hope not. Um, I think that... You, you keep in mind that Botox Cosmetic is also only approved by the FDA for the frown, that is the glabella or the, the 11s between your eyebrows, and then for the crow's feet. Those are the only two areas that Botox Cosmetic is approved for. Yet, I, you know, almost everybody is using it, what we call off-label, in all these other body areas, the neck, the forehead, you know, the corners of the mouth, etc., 
so so this has the potential of that happening as well. Uh, the company is going to great lengths to make sure that people are properly certified, that it's only sold through aesthetic board-certified physicians. Um, and I think for at least the first couple of years of the product, will be they'll be able to keep it to those uh, very highly trained uh, specialized providers. But again, yes, I don't know, especially since, uh, you know, the company that owns Botox Cosmetic is going to be owning it, how they'll be able to restrict that. It's it's the American way, you know. Yeah, but, but so what <laughs> should we what should we look for in a practitioner? Make sure the person who injects you with Kybella is? Officially Kybella cert- certified. Okay. Great, great advice. Because We're going to take a quick break. The company break. will not certify anybody who's not a physician. Okay, gotcha. We are going to take a quick break. When we come back, much more with Dr. Manjula Jagasothi. You are listening to Health Check with Heidi Godman on WSRQ. Be right back. Oh, I love that sunny song on this kind of rainy day. Welcome back to Health Check. I'm Heidi Godman. We are talking to Dr. Manjula Jegasothi. She's a Harvard and Yale trained aesthetic dermatologist in Miami, founder of Miami Skin Institute. We were just talking about Kybella, that cutting edge new treatment, a non-surgical way to get rid of the little fat pocket under your chin and your neck. Now we want to talk about something that Dr. Manjula Jagasothi also gets a ton of questions about, and that's allergens in cosmetics. You know, you, you use these things, you think they're not going to harm you. They're, they're just things to make us look pretty. Uh, but, but sometimes there are these, these ingredients in cosmetics that surprisingly can cause some terrible reactions. So we want to address them. And during the break, Manjula and I were talking about nail polish and I'm really not a nail polish person, and I'm glad about it because there is something in nail polish that surprisingly can cause an allergic reaction. Manjula, what is it? It's called toluin with a T as in Thomas. And it's funny because it aerosolizes into the air and causes a dermatitis or rash that can be very hard to control in the eyelids, not in the nails. Hmm. Is that in everybody's uh, nail polish? Uh, it- It's not in everybody, and it's interesting also because you could be wearing nail polish for decades and all of a sudden develop this allergy. So that's, as you said, you know, it's surprising because we think that these things make us pretty and then everybody's been doing the same thing or using the same brands that they've been happy with for a long time and all of a sudden they have this problem. They come to the dermatologist and they can't believe that the nail polish that they've been using forever has, has has an ingredient in it that's causing an inflammation of their eyelids. Wow. Okay. So a, an inflammation of the eyelids. Is that the only place where you get the dermatitis? Pretty much. A few people get it around the, the cuticle, but most people get it on the eyelids. And it is the most common form of eyelid dermatitis, which actually is a very common thing in women. Mm. All right. So what would be the mechanism for you to suddenly develop a reaction to this if you've been using nail polish with this ingredient your whole life? I think most of my patients who come, who present with it, are people who spend a lot of time at the manicurist because those salons are obviously seeing many clients a day and doing multiple, multiple coats of of nail polish. And so there's a lot of toluene in the air. And that's, I think, the situation. And if it's crowded or not ventilated properly, et cetera, that's the kind of circumstance in which you would get it. It's not likely that you would get it just from your own home application of one or two coats of polish, you know, every few weeks. Mm. All right. Very interesting. So if you're having some sort of eyelid dermatitis, that might be one place to to investigate, even if you've never had a problem with that before. But it, what could we do right. in the meantime to prevent that? So um, there's now a lot of nail polishes, companies that have come out with nail polishes that are actually toluene-free. And if you go online and look, there's um, not as many. Some of the more popular brands have uh, a line and a line extension of toluene-free nail polishes, but there are also companies such as Aveeno and some of these companies that say that they're all vegan and, and organic-type uh, makeup products that have nail polish lines. Those would 
would tend to be toluene free. So right. anything that's eco friendly is going to be more likely to be toluene free. Okay, so look for a, a green sort of a nail polish, not the color, but but <laughs> <laughs> but but definitely, or a, you could say a vegan nail polish, even though I don't Correct. know. Correct. Yeah, there are. That's really... what I was going to say green, but I just wanted yeah, to say yeah, you know, it, it's. Uh, I mean, there it's it's not a vegan product, but it, I think a lot of people are familiar with that term, so you could think of it that way. And can you find yeah. these kind of all-natural nail polishes just anywhere, or do you need to get them from yes, your doctor? Yes, they're available everywhere, and they're not more expensive. I think the only issue is that they don't come in this great uh, variety of colors that the, that the ordinary nail polishes do. Mm, all right. And do you think that's going to change? Do you see a lot of nail polishes, nail polish companies switching to this, this method of not including that ingredient? Yes, I think that in the long run, no nail polishes will have this ingredient. And and as long as we're talking about it, does nail polish hurt your fingernails in any way? No. The thing that actually hurts your nails or the skin around your nails or sets up infection is that when most manicurists do like to cut the cuticle because it gives a cleaner, uh, more long-lasting manicure, uh, cutting the cuticle is the worst thing you can do for your nail and the area around your nail in terms of fungus and infection. So if you merely have your cuticle pushed back and not cut, then you shouldn't have any issues with a manicure in general. Mm. So if you see your manicurist get those little teeny scissors out, run for it. Correct. Or just say no. Okay, very interesting. (laughs) Well, we want to talk about some other allergens that can affect us through cosmetics, but we need to take a quick break for news and weather. You are listening to Health Check with Heidi Godman on WSRQ. More with Dr. Manjula McJegasothi in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to Health Check. I'm Heidi Godman. We are talking today with Dr. Manjula Jegasothi. She's a Harvard and Yale trained aesthetic dermatologist, founder of the Miami Skin Institute over in good old Miami. And we've been chatting about different allergens in cosmetics. So these products that we use and we think they're healthy and we think we're, they're enhancing us and helping us may actually be causing some allergies. For example, Manjula was telling us that there's something in nail polish that might cause dermatitis, might give you some inflamed eyelids, and and you don't want that. So if you are experiencing some sort of eye allergy, ask your doctor, hey, could it be this nail polish I'm wearing? And maybe that's just the the nature of the problem. Or there could be something in your eyeshadow. And Manjula, tell us what might be in your eyeshadow. Sure. Um, A lot of us love shiny eyeshadows, particularly for night time looks and um, the most common ingredient they use in different colored eyeshadows to produce that shine is called mica m-i-c-a and it's a it's a stone much like quartz or glass or any of that and mica in eyeshadow has been known to cause a lot of eyelid dermatitis as well Hmm. so if you do have this issue if you find that your eyelids are irritated and particularly after a big night out uh, (laughs) don't think it's just because of the alcohol you drank or because you're dehydrated, it could actually be from your eyeshadow. Yeah. Um, the treatment for that is using a topical corticosteroid cream such as cortisone 10 or something like that. And in fact, I'm pretty um, susceptible to this. So whenever I use a mica-based eyeshadow, meaning a shiny eyeshadow, I in fact remove it with a little bit of over-the-counter topical cortisone 10 cream. Mm, that helps. Okay, that's a good idea. All right, and be careful not to get it in your eye, I guess. And then there, yeah. there's something else that we hear a lot about, and that's parabens. Yes, parabens uh, have been kind of a villain of sunscreens for easily 20 to 30 years. Um, It was probably the number one ingredient in sunscreens back in the 60s and 70s and um, was responsible for a lot of sunscreen type allergies and even allergies 
from people becoming sensitized to the sun. Uh, so a lot of the sunscreen companies have, are not using parabens anymore. But what has happened is that the FDA uh, subcommittee that takes care of our overseas co- cosmetics and toiletries hasn't really gotten to all the makeup companies regarding foundations that contain parabens and other uh, you know, powders or, or uh, concealer sticks or anything like that. So parabens are everywhere else in cosmetics except for sunscreen. So it's important if you're experiencing some sort of weird facial allergy or rash that comes and goes and, you know, it's never really severe, but it's, you know, not not enough for you to go to the dermatologist, but seems to never really go away completely. You need to analyze all of your makeup that you're using for parabens. All right. Okay. So how would you be able to really tell, though? Because a lot of things, it's hard to see the ingredient list, or maybe it's not very clearly marked, it, especially if you just go to a, a, a boutique kind of a place where they're just putting these makeups in, in little cute bottles. How would you find out? Yes, I agree. Um, the beauty is is that one thing the FDA Cosmetics and Toiletries Division has mandated probably in the last 10 years is that if you are using a brand that's, you know, a fairly well-known brand, not something that somebody's mixing up in their house, then online you should be able to Google their ingredients. Okay. All right. Very interesting. Let's talk also about another ingredient that can sometimes lead to side effects, such as glycerin. Yes, glycerin is also an interesting uh, ingredient because it is something that gives every product that it's in a nice silky texture and feel. And so it was pretty much ubiquitous. It was everywhere in uh, moisturizers and face creams. And, you know, if you're talking about the old formulations of Nivea and Pond's cold cream and all those things that everyone used to love in the 60s and 70s, um, those were all glycerin-based. And then uh, dermatologists started seeing that people were getting, you know, sort of long chronic reactions to these the, these ponds, cold cream, and, and um, Dove, and those things, and they don't have a lot of ingredients in them. So finally, I, I suppose about 20, 15 to 20 years ago, we found that it was glycerin that was probably the main culprit in most of these allergies. allergies are. So if you're, again, having something that comes and goes, uh, does not completely go away, make sure you assess all of your moisturizers for the product, for the ingredient glycerin. Okay. So if, if for some reason you are using one of these products and and you suddenly have a side effect and you just, I mean, maybe it's not bad enough to go to the doctor, but you recognize, oops, this could be a side effect of something I'm using and you stop using it, how long do you give it for the side effect to go away before you then need to go to the doctor? I would say you stop using it and you, get, and you use some cortisone 10 over the counter on the rash and if within a week... It's not completely gone, and then if you've changed your makeup or your moisturizer or whatever the offending agent was, and within uh, three, three to four weeks, a month, it hasn't come back, essentially you're cured. Um, if it does come back within that period of time, then you need to go and see a dermatologist so that you can get a more thorough evaluation. Terrific. Okay, well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Manjula Jagasothi, for coming on the program and telling us all about Kybella, which is that, <laughs> that new product that can help get rid of the fat under the neck, and also for telling us about allergens in different cosmetics, because I think both of these are things that we need to know. Certainly, Kybella is a topic that you're going to be hearing more and more about, so educate yourself about that. A lot of those topics out there, we all just need to know about them, even if we're not using them. And if we want to know about some of the other great things that you do, Manjula, tell us how we can find you on the internet. Sure. Um, my website is miamiskininstitute.com. I also have blogs on Google Plus and WordPress. And as I mentioned before, my before and after results galleries on Pinterest.com, search Miami Skin Institute, as well as Facebook and Twitter. Great. Okay, miamiskininstitute.com and also Miami Skin Institute at Pinterest. I love before and after pictures, no matter what it is, a person makeover, a house makeover. <laughs> so I think they're just a lot of fun. So, And a lot of yes. fun talking to you too, Manjula. I really appreciate you. your time. Thank so you. we'll talk to you again soon.
Great. Have a great day, Heidi. You Thank too. you. Thanks. All right. Again, everybody, it's MiamiSkinInstitute.com if you're interested. What, what a very interesting and skilled physician. Okay, going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to my great friend, Dr. Dean Sutherland, who's here in-house with us. Can't wait to see him. This is Health Check with Heidi Godman on WSRQ. We'll be right back.